Hello, Dr. Lawson from Zambia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Ivan from Congo Brazzaville. Welcome. Utasubiri kidogo. So we start in one minute. We leave some people time to come. Okay, I think we are ready to start. We are past five minutes. And I would like to thank you all to be part of this webinar about the future and trend in supply chain. So our moderator today will, will be Pamela Steele that will take over from the next uh, coming presentation of the panelists. Hi, Pamela, how are you? Hello, um, Nettie, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to participate. My name is Pam Steele, and I'm so delighted to be moderating this session. For one, because I am the president of the IAPHL Kenya chapter, and uh, PSA is also the international ch channel partner for ASEM. And uh, the two uh, have put this event together and uh, super, super excited. I'm just reminding you that our topic is split into two parts. First, we had we have an ongoing moderate, moderated discussion on the IAPHL community platform, which is has led up to today's webinar, but that discussion is continuing. So please feel free to uh, have your voice there. And today we are lucky to have a panel of experts with us. They'll share their knowledge of the topic, and you'll also have the chance as participants to add your thoughts uh, to the discussions. 
So I'm really looking forward to a, a lively session, let it not be one-sided, that will kick off with a presentation by Fernanda, followed by a discussion based on some of the questions. So let me introduce our panel, then dive into the presentation by Fernanda. Um, Nate, if you can uh, share the list of our participants here. Uh, first, I'll start off with uh, Douglas J. Kent. Douglas is the Executive Vice President of Corporate and AMP Alliances at ASCM. He oversees ASCM's North American chapters, international training partners, and corporate clients, and is responsible Sorry. for growing mm -hmm. and strengthening mm -hmm. the organization's strategic alliances. Okay. Kent has over 35 years of transformational advisory and practitioner experience with large multinational organizations. He specializes in score based on transformation for those of you who have come across score model, supply chain strategy and arm segmentation, supply chain planning, enterprise risk optimization and supply chain visibility. As a certified score master instructor, he has traveled the globe leading workshops, education, and transformational programs. Kent holds a master's degree in international business from Pepperdine University and a bachelor's degree in marketing from Indiana University and has been an adjunct faculty for more than 20 years. Next. Next is a lady I have known for many years, professional friend known as Fernanda Bebalian. Fernanda is the regional director for Central and South America and Solutions Architect for Sustainability and Global Health at ASCM. She has over 20 years of experience in manufacturing, inventory management, logistics operations, and distribution network design for multinational companies such as SC Johnson, Shell lubricants and NGOs in the public health space in low and middle income countries. Fernanda has been involved in multiple capacity building initiatives in different countries with ASEM. She's an ethics instructor and holds a BS in chemical engineering from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de, 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 de Janeiro and an MSc degree in management of logistics and production systems from the Col de Mines de Nantes, France. Next. Third with us is a, a member of the IAPHL. Altaf Bijarani is a seasoned professional in the field of health procurement and supply chain management with a robust 12 year track record. He's working as deputy manager of supply chain for the common management unit for TB, malaria and COVID as principal recipient office of the Global Fund. He's also serving as the governing council member of the International Association of Public Health Logisticians. That's where we connect. His expertise lies in effectively managing the supply chain for essential health commodities, particularly for national tuberculosis program and malaria initiatives in Pakistan. Ataf has been a steadfast supporter of the Ministry of National Health Services, Regulation and AMP, coordination in Pakistan. His extensive experience okay. encompasses the end-to-end -end management of supply chain operations covering areas such as quantification, customs clearance, warehouse management, and timely distribution of supplies. Notably, during the challenging period of historic floods in Pakistan, Alta played a pivotal role in the health sector, specifically focusing on combating malaria. His significant contributions ensured the uninterrupted flow of essential supplies during this critical time. Ataf holds a diverse educational background, have completed his BBA, MBA, MS, SCM, MS, PH, and obtained various certifications. So these are credible people. Next. The next person is a professional colleague whom I've worked with closely, uh, both here in Africa, but also uh, overseas, Tom Brown. Tom has been a supply chain management professional for 22 years, the last 18 of which have been focused on health sector supply chains. His mission during this period has been to use supply chain management excellence 
to increase access to medicines and other health, co uh, health technologies. Thomas gained valuable insight into the challenges inherent in aligning supply chains with clinical practice to deliver improved health outcomes. And key skills and experiences <laughs> include 22 years experience in supply chain management, 18 years of experience in supply chain management in global health, 14 years of experience on successful central medical stores reform projects in Botswana, Zambia, Uganda, and East Timor. All these I'm, I'm aware about. Tom has 18 years of senior management experience with central medical stores institutions, five years of experience leading a major USID-funded reform program under the SCM's project in Botswana, including one year as country director. He's an expert in national and international supply chain operations, including strategic and tactical planning, quality management, and performance systems, warehousing, inventory management, distribution, focusing techniques. And um, if you scroll below, I can see this last item, uh, focusing techniques. Um, yeah. OK. And the last one, of course, is me. And I don't think. Uh, we need so much time to introduce myself. All I can say about me is that I'm a passionate supply chain professional and delighted really to have this opportunity to collaborate with you people uh, because most of you I know. So without so much ado, I think um, uh, Nati, we will go over to Fernanda to give us a glimpse of some of the recent research and findings that uh, they have around this topic. Yes. Take it away, Fernanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. So before Fernanda starts to present the, the, the 10 trends, we'll start with our first poll. We mm -hmm. have for now uh, 39 participants, and we'd like to, to know uh, which are the different trends that you would like to learn more about. So let me share the first poll, and you will be able to give your insights. The, the rumors they've been hearing all along. Two more minutes and then we'll, uh, and I will share the results. There is a poll, please feel free to put your insights. What are the trends that you you are more interested in learning about? And then Fernanda will, will present one each of them. So we have uh, 31 respondents, so let me share the findings. Can you see the, the result? And I will read it through. So the first position is digitalization of the supply chain. 74%. The second one is the supply chain, big data and analysis. And then comes after the artificial intelligence. And then we have visibility, traceability, 
and location intelligence. And then we have uh, the disruption and risk management that is tied with the agility. So those are the, the trend that got the more percentage. Hello, Fernanda. Does it give you a hint for your presentation? Yeah, it's pretty much aligned with the top trends. Yeah. This is interesting mm -hmm. with the ranking. Mm -hmm. I think we're all aligned. <laughs> okay. So I will give you the Good. floor for you to present. And we can. Thank you. Thanks, Nati. Um, if you want to go to the to the next slides, and and thanks again for the whole IHPL team for putting together um this great webinar. I'm one of the proud members based in South South America. I know there's not many of us here, but I've been one of the members since the very beginning of IHPL, and I'm very proud and happy to be here. So I wanted to give everyone a background where this is coming from. As Douglas mentioned on the beginning. Um, this has been we have ASM has been doing this um, this research on the trends for over ten years, about ten years, um, and this is something that um, kind of guide us in our research and the content development and everything else. And I think it's a great opportunity to share it with a wider audience. So, how was that done? This is not you know not like everyone woke up one day and now we have the trend. So this is worth over a year of research um, on what what it's trending on those topics. So we have a committee called um, Sensing Committee, Omera Volunteers. Uh, these individuals are based over 13 countries. This for, for this specific year, we had 31 people participating. And these people are from different backgrounds. When you see the research, you can have a deeper dive who these are. But we had um, practitioners, people from the thought leaders, so all of them um, were given this huge task of going over many, many references. Um, Nat, if you wanna go to the next slide, for them to see how how this is dissected. Yeah, so, so this team, they will start looking to many different resources. So 400 citations that were examined from them. Um, these were analytics, uh, research reports, perfect uh, were examined by a group of people. So they were starting drilling down to extract what were those trends. So they can start pinpointing what are what are the trends. Um, those trends. How likely is this thing to happen or, or how big is the impact? And also in the report on one of the last pages, there's a matrix where you can see each of the trends with the highest impact and high likelihood. So this is also interesting. So based on this criteria, they started voting and this is how um, they were voted to be from one to 10 in terms of the trends. So it is a collective effort from a global team in different, different topics. Um, and if you wanna to go to the next slide, Ned. Yeah, so this is how it kind of narrows. So from those 400s, then you have the first cut of the subtrends. Then the subtrends got narrowed again, and then 20 went up for both. And this is how we got the top 10 that you'll be seeing on the next slide, if you want to move to the next slide. Yeah, so here it is, the big the big reveal. So typically, we reveal um, all of the next year trends at ASCM International Conference. Everyone gets excited and wants to know where this where this falls out. Um, their favorite topic. I particularly monitor sustainability, so I was like, oh my god, it felt too from from last year. But this is something that the whole community um, looks forward to every year. So in twenty, so in our conference in Austin in twenty twenty four, we'll see what are the trends for twenty twenty five. And we already have the committee getting together and started to work in an exam on the new trends for next year. So this is the big reveal. No, uh, nothing 
to difference from the poll, um, digital supply chain has been the top in the top three for for a couple of years. So it gained one spot compared to last year's. Uh, big data really falling along. So they're always on on the on the top three, and artificial intelligence raised one. So this these top three are really key for us to see how much digitization and digital capabilities will really play a role in the supply chain and how it's important for us to know how to embrace those uh, those new scape, these new scape, new capabilities. So the first one, digital supply chain, how do we turn physical things into digital, big data and analytics? How do we get data and transform them into information? Data on its own is worth nothing if it can be converted in useful any strategic information. Um, artificial intelligence also up there, up there from our poll. So how how to use um, artificial intelligence um, to make our lives more efficient? Uh, this where you can think about the robots that do the picking in those warehouses and all the machine learning algorithm that will start powering your predictive analytics and everything. So how can we have computers help us um, take better decisions? Supply chain investment in systems and people. This is a new trend. This is this is about how do I bring these new technologies, systems, and I need to prepare the people to be able to use them. You can't have you know the the systems without you know the human uh, behind it. So this is what it means as well. Visibility, traceability, and location intelligence also a new one and will be enabled by the digital technology. So for you to have all those capabilities of, of knowing where your product is, being able to, to trace it, locate it, have real-time information, you probably will need to have the other top three trends um, well-suited, have data, have digitization in order to have them. Uh, disruption in, and risk management fell three positions compared to, to last year, meaning how, how are supply chains being able to map and assess their risks um, agility and resilience, it's a new one and, and a huge, huge topic. Um, more and more supply chains yeah. are being impacted by external influences and being agile and resilient means how are our supply chains ready to deal with all of this uncertainty and yeah. external influences that will, it is for sure that we'll need to manage throughout the years to come, especially with, you know, climate change, uh, geopolitical instabilities and things like this. Supply chain and cybersecurity has fallen too, but it's still a, a big one. Green and circular supply chains, as I was mentioning, is one that I also follow very closely, felt too. Um, if you, last year we had um, sustainability as the topic, now we can see it shifted to green and circular supply chains. It's circular supply chains, meaning how, do, how does our supply chains are using their materials uh -huh. the most, how are they keeping materials flow in the supply chain? And, and, and if we think um, that circular supply chains will be a key enable and are a key enable for the circular economy, which is kind of the next big thing for the world to tackle. And the last one, which is also a new one, is around the geopolitical and deglobalization of supply chain, everything um, having to do with near shoring, um, French shoring, how do we bring those supply chains shorter and simpler? So this is what this trend is about. So if you wanna move to the next page, um, Nadi, I think we are ready. Yes, so you have this QR code at the end again. So you have the full report with additional details and, and more on those specific trends. Um, we we'll have that, that same QR code for you to download it again. So I think we are ready to kick off the conversation. I think I'll hand it over back to Pam. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Fernanda. That's really, really interesting. And uh, I should say that sometimes mid last year, I did do a blog on the trending uh, aspect with this application. And most of these um, uh, concepts or topics uh, seem to appear there. You didn't consult me, but I can see them there. And I should say that perhaps the, the priority uh, um, depends on the sector. I think for our sector, uh, the new one in 2024, which is supply chain investments and systems and people really seems to, to, to be a priority for us because without that investment, and you know, oftentimes there is no investment in our health supply chain or human logistics, perhaps human logistics does better, but not 
uh, health supply chain. So uh, that really leads us to uh, uh, our first question. Uh, we start by discussing the importance of investing in both the technology and people behind our supply chains, especially to stay strong and flexible during public health issues as we saw recently with the uh, COVID pandemic. So our first question focuses on supply chain investment systems and people. And I would like to call upon our staff uh, to share with us some of his thoughts on how how you know how do you perceive the importance of investing in both supply chain systems and people in ensuring resilience and adaptability, especially in the context of public health challenges? Alta, let's hear from you. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Uh, Yes, I mean, supply chain investment is uh, one of the new trends in 2024, as we uh, seen in earlier slides. Uh, for me, this concept, I mean, if we talk about in the low middle income countries, uh, especially during the pandemic, there have been discussion about the supply chain resilience and adaptability uh, during the health crisis. And... Uh, where the public health system countries and organization started realizing I've called, the, I've called is that is realizing really the supply chain investments and uh, this supply chain investments uh, if we talk about the terms at, in the systems its uh, supply chain system is the general larger umbrella and we we have like the uh, few major components where they have been uh, where they have been the discussions and investments being considered by the low middle income countries and the uh, organizations such as like if we talk about in the inventory management systems if we talk about the logistic systems warehouse systems transportations i mean information systems so uh, these these are basically the backbones for the public health to uh, whenever we talk about the resilience and the agile supply chains, uh, we, we have been like observing during the pandemic and the health crisis, the uh, medical supplies were available at most of the time uh, to the uh, country level and the down levels, but but due due to the low investments, due to the low visibility, uh, the uh, availability at the necessary levels were not implemented by the public health uh, organizations. So, I mean, this this is one of the importance which which now are being realized and investments are being discussed in terms of the supply chain. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we if we discuss about the investment in the supply chain. Uh, 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 health workforce, I mean, this is again one of the major uh, area where, I mean, the systems are being invested, but but the, we need to uh, have been, we need, uh, we need to invest as well in the people where we have the skills labor to, I mean, to have the resilience supply chain of to, uh, to respond to any health emergencies so so this this has to be equal by the uh, i mean the investment in the system and investments in the people as equal importance to have the resilience so these these are not only the short terms because uh, organizations public health uh, uh, i mean organizations countries uh, have been now discussing for the long term investments because resilience is not a short term it it will mm -hmm. it get it it provides the results in the longer term. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much, Alta. And uh, I should also say that uh, uh, until recently, there wasn't really focus on investing in systems and people. And I remember taking up a project uh, with the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation in Nigeria. And I, I just wanted to hear from Tom, because uh, you were with the BMGF at some point, and uh, what really drove you to choose to invest in systems and people? Because that is actually what we were focusing on, on the transformation, looking at both the system, but also uh, the workforce. So what, what was the driver to that? If I pick on you, Tom, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, let me just start by saying thanks thanks for the invitation to this, to this webinar. It's absolutely great to be here. Um, so to, yeah, to come to your, to your question, I mean, there was more to that work in that we were involved in than systems and people. It was kind of a holistic view of trying to improve supply chain and, in, and included a lot of thoughtful engagement with private sector. 
And to me, I think this is the thing that I would actually like to add to this to this conversation. When we think about investing in systems and people, there's, there's going to improve the way that public health supply chains perform. We should think very carefully or advise governments very carefully on the relative uh, pros and cons or um, choosing partnerships with other partners that are available in the ecosystem who can provide skills and can provide access to systems. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I'm, 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 I'm not trying to say that private sector fixes every problem, I'm, I don't believe that at all, but I think that's a key strategic question. It's a kind of a pre, a, an important early strategic question, if you like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, does really? government want to be an owner and operator of systems? Mm -hmm. and an owner? Mm -hmm. Is it better to use the partners that are available in out there in the ecosystem? Indeed, and you invoke the name of the private sector. I just want to bring Douglas in because uh, they Douglas, would you say there's a a good appreciation of the importance of investing in supply chain with a focus on systems and people, because we know that majority of those in the private sector seek to get qualified people. Uh, you cannot get qualified people, but you do not pay them what they decide or look after them. Uh, what is what is your view on this aspect of supply chain investment systems and people? Um, yeah, so I, I agree with both Altav and Tom. I think what we see is it's it's kind of a tale of two cities. So mm -hmm. what we have is the technology side has become arguably more available and more affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, the, that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is that the, the, the trend of having the talent keep pace with the availability and affordability of technology isn't there. So what we have is that that's the tale of two cities. The good news is we have it and it's more affordable. The bad news is our talent hasn't come to the same pace of being able to utilize the technology in an effective way. And, mm -hmm. and so that makes the investment not such a su such a great decision. So we, we follow sort of the sexy investments and we try to utilize in this intelligence of digitization and artificial intelligence, but not as much in an effective way. So we need to equalize, we need to equalize the pace, making sure that as we invest in the technology, we equally invest in the people and the utilization of the skills and the competencies to make that investment have a hard, you know, a really good return on investment. And that's what really where the challenge is. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let me go back to our talk because I want to follow up on uh, what practical opportunities and challenges, if any, do you see arising from the trend of supply chain investment systems and people, uh, given that this is an area that you've acknowledged as um, a priority, uh, what are you seeing in the sector or where you are in Pakistan? Hello, al yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, if I talk about the uh, challenges, uh, I mean, yes, there, there are certain multiple challenges, but the most important is like if any organization is trying to invest in the systems and the people uh, starting uh, from the first step, I mean, uh, they need, uh, I mean, uh, upfront investment in the system supply chain in investment uh, in the systems, they need a huge investments over there. So it's it's now then it's very difficult for the organizations, especially for the public sector uh, to to have the funds for those investments. So they really face a lot of challenges to take the decision either do we have to invest in the supply chain or we have to to deal with the core other um, i mean activities over there it's very difficult at times for the organization especially when we talk about the public health to balance those investments and at at 
the discussions are being uh, may, uh, are being made at the top management that we need to have the resilience supply chain we need to have the investment but when to, when coming up to the making the actual investments uh, uh, so it's it's again then they back off and then the the, the investments due to the uh, constraints in the funding they they go to the other activities i mean these this is one of the major challenge with them so again opportunity is to like to have the i mean uh, supply chain resilience uh, as one of the organizational goal to align with them and and then they can especially to start from the steps some baby steps to keep investing and getting the uh, results in 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 a short term as well as a long term so i mean keeping those balance is very important so opportunities are there challenges are again there for thank you Mm. And perhaps it's about acknowledging the importance of supply chain. If there is no, if we've not learned from the impact of COVID, uh, then perhaps uh, we need something else to teach us of, of the value of uh, supply chain uh, to the uh, access to healthcare. Now, um, moving on to visibility, traceability, and location intelligence, and this is a question that I think all of you can, uh, you know, would have some view. And I'll talk Tom and Douglas. I just want to know from you. Uh, let me push, push it to, 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 to Douglas first from uh, I know you've done practical work, but take it up from the ASCM angle, and then I'll come to Tom to give his view. How can organizations leverage visibility, traceability, and location intelligence technologies to enhance supply chain resilience and address public health concerns? There's been a lot of talk on resilience, and 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 we today we have um, um, emerging technologies with artificial intelligence. So how can organizations leverage visibility, traceability, and location intelligence technologies to enhance supply chain resilience to address public health concerns? Um, Douglas, uh, and then we can get more thoughts from Tom. Great, thank you, Pamela. So I I think it's very much tied to the earlier discussion relative to the investment. So so this sort of control tower like view mm -hmm. has been a decade long discussion, right? So um, in order for that to happen, we have to have all the participants within the ecosystem providing data in order to to have that control tower view. So that means we have to have that visibility. We have to have that transparency. We have to have the ability to understand the location and the tracking and tracing capabilities. And that means that each of the parties in the ecosystem have to provide that data in order to have that control tower like view. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, again, it's very similar to my earlier comments in the, the relative importance in the public health supply chain is, is undeniable, right? We have to be able to see that, you know, we, 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 have villages that you know we can track and trace you know uh, a, a bottle of coca-cola to the end recipient but we can't do it with medicines and vaccines right mm -hmm. this is very disappointing so and, and and again i go back to the point that this is not a this is not an issue of technology it's actually an issue of trust it's an issue of that we have to provide this information into uh, into a system where we can gain the control tower view. So that's that's really the importance of that. And and I I, I think again the technology is not what's holding us back. It's the trust mm -hmm. across the ecosystem mm -hmm. level of players that is actually the challenge for us to actually gain that that top control tower like view. And that's very interesting. It sounds familiar because I've been involved in projects. Uh, uh, focused on improving visibility, uh, setting up control towers, and the element of trust that you raise is so important. And I know Tom has may have a view on this because some of the projects he's been involved in in the past, whether through investment as an investor, but also the current programs that they are working on in a global health PSM, um, uh, may have some of those issues of concern. Um, Tom, any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's interesting to hear, to hear Douglas talking about trust. I mean, I I couldn't agree, couldn't agree more. I mean, some you know, this whole issue about data culture in the public mm -hmm. sector um, is a is a key enabler of or barrier to 
properly digitizing supply chains and the kind of open data sharing that we're talking about and it's it's a it can be a tricky problem to unpick it's not it's not just about someone say you know uh, one leader saying one time, you know, we should do this, we should be open and share our data, and we do it in this way, and we are now a data, you know, we're now an open data government that, that requires a huge amount of work and demonstration through action rather than just words. Um, so working on the on the on the culture within government is, is is a critical thing. I do come back to this point about um about using all of the capabilities in in an ecosystem not just looking at trying to fix something in the in the public sector one thing that has happened in the last few years has been changes in the private sector particularly in africa um and we've seen the emergence of a new like, class or type of organization in africa small innovators technology based that offer new types of service in health product supply chains that we that we didn't have certainly 10 years ago maybe even 6 or 7 years ago and there's different types of services, you know, business to business ones, direct to consumer um, supply chain services, direct to consumer information services that do provide some of those verification and traceability services through apps that that, that we're talking about. Um, there's an, uh, there's a, uh, an initiative called I3, which some of you may know about, which Chemonix is a sponsor of, as are many other organizations, which tries to showcase some of these organizations. P partners are out there that have developed their own technology and capability that can help to do this if we can find the right ways to bring them into solving public sector supply chain problems so i think that's one of the challenges for us is how we do that and very important and again all these topics we are talking about um perhaps they would need to be uh, another webinar to zoom into the into the bottleneck so you know why why is there no trust or where is there lack of investment for us to really come up with uh, real solutions? At this point, it's for, sort of acknowledging them, but also sharing those uh, perspectives because the trust is, is key. There may be other infrastructure or infrastructure related challenges or, or people related challenges, but trust is critical. Um, and, and, and we've seen where there is trust, where there is um, collaboration that things can work. If you take, for example, the global health, um, rather global uh, van, uh, which is for reproductive health um, uh, commodities, that seems to work. And we've seen uh, ministries uh, rallying behind it, becoming members and really finding value in that. So these things can work and it's more of really understanding um, what makes it work or not, and then dealing with those um, um, bottlenecks. So let's move on because this is a, a rich uh, discussion, but what are the practical opportunities? I mean, we mentioned that challenge, actually, uh, trust with the, with the trend of visibility, traceability, and local uh, intelligence. But what are those, what, are there practical opportunities um, if we focus only on that because the challenges, some of them we highlighted. Um, I'll talk uh, where you are. Um, is this a problem? Uh, in Pakistan, and um, you know, if so, uh, what are the practical opportunities that you see or challenges from uh, from where you sit? Yes, I mean, uh, I echo with the the Douglas. Trust is very important. I mean, to have the uh, informed decisions, data play a very key role uh, in in the public health. I mean. Uh, the developing countries are facing a lot of challenges uh, uh, in the terms of the visibility, medical uh, commodities are available, those are at times available from different partners, but, but reaching to the end user, reaching to the patients at times, it, it gets difficult. So uh, if we talk about the opportunities, there have been certain uh, investments in the supply chain by private sectors by the uh, up to the at the central level and then then having having a consolidated plan for the supply chain to have the visibility that is missing so i mean uh, coordination within the partners to have the trust level and then then they can they can work on the available uh, 
uh, I mean, the opportunities they have that that they can really solve for the patient. This is what I see the opportunities which which can especially be be managed by the public sector organization, even even the government in the public health. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to move on to another important question here. And Douglas, I'm coming to you uh, regarding digitizing supply chains, particularly in low and middle income countries, public health systems. What do you are some of the trends we are seeing and what are the opportunities and challenges in countries adopting technological innovations in their supply chains? I hope that is straightforward uh, a question. Um, um, let me know if I have to, 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 to repeat it. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, uh, no, the, the question is straightforward. The answer is not. So uh, that's the, <laughs> that, that, be, that becomes the challenge. So, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not just specific to the public health sector, but we have an opportunity to digitize the supply chain, but let's, let's, reel back a little bit and understand like why is this important what we're trying to do is make the supply chain more more efficient more effective because we've been faced with particularly in the last two to three years more supply chain disruption than we've ever faced in the history right mm -hmm. so these demand and supply shocks to the system have really illuminated the fact that we're not strategically resilient. Our, our public health supply chains are not are, are not built around the, the need for resiliency that they need to have. So, and, and we break this down resiliency into sort of two, two sort of strategic and operational resiliency. Operational resiliency is our ability to bounce back from disruption. Strategic resiliency is our ability to bounce forward to a new operating model to understand that we actually are going to be faced with disruption in the future. And we need to, you know, we need to figure out ways that we can accept mm -hmm. those challenges and work effectively. So digitization is one of those aspects where we say, OK, maybe we can build more resiliency, maybe more strategic resiliency. And, and in that case, we have to use digitization to build a new operating model, to figure out how we can accept the level of disruption that we're gonna be faced in the future. And, and no one's denying the fact that disruptions are going to continue. I mean, it, it, geopolitical and otherwise, we, you know, we have so much disruption in, in our supply chains today that we just have to figure out new operating models that are gonna be fueled by digitization. And so we need to figure out how to effectively apply those so we can become more strategically resilient and we can redesign our supply chains for resiliency. Mm -hmm. And talking about resilience, I know others may have an opinion on that question that I've asked uh, of you, but I, I also want to save time for participants to be able to ask some questions. So I'll move on to uh, the next question to do with resilience. So on the topic of agility and resilience, I'm, Tom, I'm talking to you, please. What are some important strategies that low middle income countries already adopt that you know or should consider adopting in their public health supply chains? And how do current efforts to deglobalize supply chains support these agility and resilience strategies? Again, if the question is not clear, I can repeat, but uh, I hand over to you, Tom. No, that's crystal clear. Thanks, Pam. So, all right, let's let's take these in in turn. So, uh, agility. So, why why do we want agility in in supply chains? It's really to be more responsive to the needs of of patients or consumers. Um, so, in the work that we do, I think one of the most successful strategies that that we see countries trying is increasing the rhythm or the cadence of the supply chain. So, typically, this is this rhythm or drumbeat or cadence, whatever word you want to use of the supply chain is much slower than the commercial sector. But if you if you can increase that cadence of both serving the last mile and the, the cadence of your inbound through procurement strategies, that can make a big difference to how mm -hmm. agile you are in responding to changes that you see in demand. So that, that already happens in some places. I think another strategy that um, is definitely in use for agility is differentiation. Um, so not all products are the same. They have different demand characteristics. They've got different supply characteristics. So part of improving agility, I think, is not just improving that cadence, but doing it 
thoughtfully for groups of products where it makes most sense mm -hmm. um, and perhaps doing different things for other product groups where it, uh, where different strategies are needed. So one one example of differentiation is multi-month dispensing, which is quite a well-known strategy now for um, uh, ART programs uh, where multiple months of product are dispensed to patients who are deemed at low risk of loss to follow up. Um, so yeah, that's that's a kind of an, an example of channel channel differentiation, if you like. So that could, so channel differentiation can help with agility where it's where it's required. On resilience, I mean, th th there's some basic things that um, a lot of supply chains have been doing for years that that are kind of linked to resilience. I mean, at any time you have buffer stock in an inventory system, that's partly to do with the fact that you can't always accurately. Lots of other other things in the supply chain. So um, we could say that's a basic thing that countries have been doing for a long time, which is in favour of, of resilience. Procurement strategies where you buy the same product from multiple suppliers spreads the risk of non-supply. That's a, you could also argue that's that's in service of, res of resilience. I think there's three, three things um, for resilience strategies. First of all, start from an evidence base, right? Some strategies involve intentionally building a bit of redundancy in to improve resilience that requires investment that requires evidence so that's the starting point engage broadly beyond the supply chain and beyond health strategies and investment will need broad support when you know there's policy reforms that go with it uh, and thirdly as i've already talked about engage the private sector that applies broadly question to think about is who's best place to help navigate some of these opportunities and trends who's got the operational expertise the ability to act quickly deploy new technology all of these things um you know finding the right ways to use all the capabilities that are available to you in a country or, or regional market um is an important part of finding a, a good resilient strategy um do you want me to answer the second part i know we're, we're tight on Please, time yes go ahead and touch on that uh, okay, and then so, ask others to drop their yeah. thoughts also on the chat box yeah okay yeah so on the on the deglobalization uh, of supply chains there's kind of three connected strands to what's happening at the moment one is a regulatory level so creating more streamlined access to markets through cooperation or harmonization at regional continental level the second one is procurement or spend pooling so creating more streamlined access to that procurement spend through multi-country collaboration on tendering and contracting um, and then encouraging new manufacturing activity in in on the continent of africa um so you put all those three together and that's you know, you know, there are initiatives which are trying to link those three to to make Africa more resilient and able to control access to health products in the face of future future disruptions. Um, things to think about there are it can be it might be more expensive in the short term. Um, new manufacturing might not be at the same scale as larger manufacturers overseas that may have price differentials. Um, Secondly, these strategies have to think about the whole supply chain, including for API production, not just the finished product. If those, if it's really going to be a resilient strategy, so let me let me pause there. And that's a wealth of experience and knowledge you're sharing within a very short time. And uh, perhaps I should say that we are not doing justice to all these topics. One topic alone is enough for you know warrants and all a whole hour. And uh, at this point, we just sort of uh, getting to engage with this top 10 trending um, uh, concepts or uh, practices. And I would encourage everyone else to put their thoughts on any of those uh, topics or rather aspects that we've discussed, uh, put your thoughts and views there. Because leading to the fifth question that I want to ask, I mean, none of these, whether it is um, agility and resilience or uh, visibility, traceability and loco location intelligence, digitalization of supply chain, none of these, would be achieved without a competent workforce, without people with demonstrable competence to make wise supply chain decisions. And that leads me to a question uh, about, I mean, a, a discussion about the skills and competences gaps in the public health sector that need addressing to achieve a higher supply chain maturity level. What are they? And here I think, uh, Fernanda, I was packing you aside because you've been working with the people, you've been involved with the training. I think to just get your thoughts and here it's open for all the panel members to give their views 
on, you know, what are the skills and competencies gaps in the public health sector that need addressing to achieve a higher supply chain maturity level? And I'll ask Fernanda to give some thoughts on this. Thanks, Pam. And, and this is not on the public health sector. I think throughout what we see, you know, in, in the public sector as well, in different companies at different maturity stages, is really for the supply chain professional to have that horizontal view of end-to-end -end supply chain, to break the silos. It can't be just procurement. It can't be just logistics. It can't be verticalized. So yes, I think one of the greatest capabilities is for the supply chain professional to understand how the supply chain works, the flow of information, the trade-offs, how their decisions will impact the other, the other chain. It's not a chain anymore. It's a network connected. So everything will be impacted. So it's really not on the training side. Of course, inventory management is key, um, quantification, forecasting, all of those skills that you can teach, but really opening their minds to see the flow of a supply chain, of a supply network, and how this is all interconnected and the trade-offs and how one decision here will impact someone else's elsewhere in the network. So I would say that this is common, not, not only on public health, but also um, in all sectors at different maturity stages. And are there metrics that we should all be using to really understand how well our end-to-end -end supply chain performance is? Are there metrics? Are there metrics? And this is this can be taken oh, by anyone. Please go ahead, Fernanda. Oh, for the metrics. Yeah, yes. so so I like to, well, we use the industry standard. Um, uh, when you think about agility, perfect order, and going down, if you use the industry standards for supply chain, the score model is what we use for reference. And then you start, I think we're going to get the tech yeah. ticket ones for, for us to plug in in those processes to start seeing it. But it's interesting because these are also strategic supply chain. So once you start going to that path, um, chances are we start having the visibility you need and how these are all connected. So this is how I like to point out to metrics from the score model. Fantastic. Um, Douglas, you have, again, perhaps that's uh, ASCM's voice, but Douglas, do you have one point to add? And uh... I, well, I, 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 again, I think it's it's about keeping pace, but part of it is to really understand, to diagnose the maturity levels of the supply chain, to understand specifically mm -hmm. what gaps do exist. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we can assume, you know, that there are specific gaps on, as we talked about, the, the, the trends on how to apply digitization, et cetera. But I think more specifically, you know, each company has its own set of gaps. And to Fernanda's comment, you know, we have a collective set of attributes on supply chain, responsiveness, uh, agility, for example, uh, even, even cost, asset utilization, sustainability. These are all important attributes. So to understand where our gaps are, we provided a benchmarking service that both we can do it qualitatively as well as quantitatively to say, what exactly is the gap in performance? And then how is that gap in performance relate to the skills and competencies gap? And then we can go in and try and fix those things. So not to take a sort of blanketed approach, but really to, to use it from a factual basis to say what mm -hmm. gaps exist and how is that manifesting itself relative to performance? This is something we do in our diagnostic work using the SCORE model as, as mm -hmm. the framework for doing so. So Fernanda and Douglas, please come in there. Let me just bring in, uh, so the last question I still want to come back to you. Let me just bring in uh, practitioners in the public health supply chain, uh, Tom and uh, Altaf. Um, Tom, is mm. there practice of maturity assessment in most of the programs that you, you perhaps have been involved in uh, to determine the gaps or when these investments are just happening in a vacuum? Is there a practice of maturity assessment uh, to determine how well, where you stand, and I'll just please think of that as well. So, yeah, there, I mean, there are, as you know, there are there are tools and frameworks available for which are used in, you know, in the programs that Chemonics implements and ones that 
you know, Gates grantees implements, right? There's different maturity models and different, slightly different ways of looking at it, I suppose. But um, mm -hmm. I mean, the idea, I think, behind all of those, which which is used in practice, is that the output of those um, of those assessments using those frameworks is used then to to try and guide investments. So I think I think mm -hmm. that does that does happen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just maybe going. I was interested in, in the discussion about about the skills. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually a lot that has been done or is in progress. I think um, that may because these things maybe take a little bit of time. It may not have borne all of the fruit that we expect, but that will that that will come. Things like you know, there's been a lot of partnerships in recent years with mm -hmm. universities in Africa to develop undergraduate and master's level supply chain programs with support from various organizations around the world. Um, and because of the time it takes to get student, you know, a, a large number of students through those programs, you know, we're not, you know, we're not yet, yet at the stage where there's hundreds of students in any country that have been through these, these programs, but that will come. Um, mm. And it would be interesting to, somehow track as a community what where those people are going can, can we find ways of mm -hmm. i don't want to use the word capture because that's, that's a horrible word but find ways of enticing them into the work that we are doing um mm -hmm. and utilize mm -hmm. those cohorts as they come out of these various programs that different donors are funding and, and supporting um that would be that could be an interesting part of the of the solution to the skills building um issue that, that you were discussing. Thanks. Correct. And are those institutions open to taking those graduates who have come through with qualification, you know? So I think that's a matter that can be looked into. But that's an area I'm interested in because I'm looking at youth engagement in supply chain. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can see what the, the, the role of institutions in this space. So I said I'm coming back to you, Douglas and uh, Saint Fernanda. How can organizations make the most? And these are our last questions. How can organizations make the most of the supply chain operations reference, which is the score model, to diagnose the health of their supply chains? Uh, Douglas, first to you. Yeah, so I mean, the easiest way oh, yeah, is easy. maybe to start with the qualitative view. So we have a free score-based qualitative assessment that we utilize. Um, particularly, we have developed one for global health. So the global health maturity model assessment allows organizations to really understand truthfully where they stand on, on the maturity levels from an end-to-end -end supply chain perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we built that together on the back of the Gates Foundation work that we did in Africa. So um, we just did a revision on this. It's being utilized by ministries of health across the continent at the moment. So any of the ecosystem players have the opportunity to do that assessment. And you can certainly contact us, myself or Fernanda, to get access to that. Um, but it's a very thorough industry-specific assessment that, that any organization has access to to really judge their maturity levels. And I think mm -hmm. if it does nothing other than start the conversation about where the opportunities exist, it's already a worthwhile investment. Wonderful. And uh, I think that represents perhaps uh, what uh, Fernanda may have said because uh, you both used the, the tool. And, and, and really, I've enjoyed this discussion, and I just wish there was more time. Perhaps we should, uh, uh, we should uh, consider having a part two of this, where we perhaps zoom into the, 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 the challenges and the opportunities that there are. Because for me, the presentation and discussions uh, on these topics of the 10 trends are focused on uh, various aspects of digital transformation, the importance of analytics and team building for supply chain optimization, the necessity for resilience and agility. It has also emphasized green and circular supply chain initiatives alongside practical sustainability practices. And, and these are not things that we can say is not a priority in our public health sector uh, because they are intertwined, they are interdependent. And you, know, you can't do one and leave the other. So what are the implications for us as practitioners? You know, what I can say is that, you know, we, we from just this discussion alone, we are encouraged to invest in systems and people 
build specialized analytic teams, prioritize agility and sustainability, and adopt digital innovations to stay ahead in a rapidly evolving landscape. We are dealing with uh, volatile, what you say, the VOCA, the volatile, ambiguous uh, environment today. Uh, we're dealing with problems with, uh, you know, in Panama, you know, affecting supply chain, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the Houthis or the ICs with all, all these affecting supply chain. So there's so much that uh, supply chain people need to be on top of, but that requires having demonstrable competence to make those wise uh, supply chain decisions. I'll hand over to um, uh, Neti because uh, we want to make sure we get the poll too. Uh, and if there are others with any questions or any thoughts, points of views on the different questions we've tackled, please post your thoughts on the chat box. And this is where I say thank you so much, the panelists, and uh, thank you so much, um, uh, IPHLSCM for organizing this, and the participants for making the time to be with us to learn. Um, uh, Neti, if there's a chance that you can get to share any questions that have been asked on the chat box, direct them to the respective um, uh, panelists. But this is where I hand over to you. And thank you again. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a great discussion. And the discussion can continue on the listserv because we actually have a moderated discussion on uh, about uh, that topic. So feel free to put all your questions there. All the experts are also linked to it. And will make a pleasure to, to answer. So thank you very much. We can move to the poll two, which is uh, asking question about with all the insights that you you got from the discussion. Um, let's move share it. Okay, so the first question will be, which will be the most applicable applicable track to you? So this is the first question. And then the second the second question will be, will you be at Indava? You want to know. <laughs> so we can have five minutes to respond. Thank you, Nati. Uh, while we at the poll, uh, I couldn't hold myself from talking because I mean I've enjoyed the session so much. Uh, I want to begin by saying thank you to Pamela. We will definitely create another opportunity for you to to bring this on again. Thank you so much, and thank you to the panelists for for the fantastic uh, uh, engagement we had today. Uh, definitely we will, we will have to call you back. It, for me, the most, uh, the favorite part of this conversation to me for, has been the chat. The chat has been very engaging. Uh, I cannot attempt to read to you uh, some of the comments that, that were there. So I want to say thank you to the participants for, for coming. Uh, so over back to you, Nati. Okay, thank you very much. So I will give just uh... 30 seconds more for people to respond. We are 31 response for now. When we'll cross the gap of 70%, I will share the, the result. So thank you very much again. Maybe we can use that time to present uh, the slide of Indaba and then we'll be ready to, to close. Timmy, would you like to? Share any information about Indaba? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, we have specifically asked you if you will be at the Indaba because uh, Douglas will be at the Indaba, um, uh, Fernanda will be at the Indaba, Ham will be at the Indaba. And the big thing is that IHPHL will be right there at the Indaba uh, talking about all of these things, one thing that we have recognized during this conversation today is that human resource, uh, competence, professionals are central to, to all of these uh, uh, top trends application in our supply chain. So this conversation both continues on the list, uh, but more significantly,
to IHPHA to facilitate the entire endeavor and kind of is engineered to hear from the should be like the 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 workforce that we are talking about that we engine I mean that we man the top trends implementation within our software. the chat box, we want to hear from people to see how we can do that. And then uh, interestingly, the PTD has been gracious to give any IHPHL uh, now it is even $200 discount. So if you register with IHPHL code, instead of getting a uh, registration at 550, It promised not to miss it. Uh, we are ready, we are here to support with any documentation that may be required of you to make the points to your organization. Uh, and we can not just wait to, to have you at Indaba. Uh, thank you very much. I'm hoping to see what the final result is about what is most relevant and people will be at Indaba and who will not. Okay. Uh, thank so, you. It's back to you, Nati. Thank you. So I've just shared the result of the poll. Uh, so we have digitalization supply chain that uh, is number one, and then the big data and analytics that is number two, and then you have uh, the rest coming there. So thank you very much. And uh, forty-five percent of our audience will be at Indaba. So please, Fantastic. you Fantastic. can you can send us uh, an email so that we can include you in our WhatsApp group because we have a lot of good things coming over for you guys. So thank you very much. I think we are at the end of this great webinar. <laughs> Yeah. Last word from our panelists before we close. Thank you, Nati, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to share and look forward to seeing you in Bangkok. Yeah. Thank you, Nati and HPL team. Looking forward to see you all there as well. Great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nati and uh, Pamela for a great discussion. See you. Thank you. Thank yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>